Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video, Bishop Barron has been asked the question, is there a real possibility for church unity? Now he has a great response and I want us to be listening to his response. And he's gonna go through you know, the Great Schism and the Reformation of 1517. And his basic conclusion is going to be that there's real differences that exist between Orthodox, Protestants, and Catholics. But because of the grace of God, there's real hope. Now in light of Vatican II, um, I think his statements make perfect sense. And, you know, as an evangelical Christian studying Catholic too and trying to understand more of Catholicism with a real, a real hope for um, an ecumenical uniting of Protestants and Catholics, specifically in the Western context that I find myself in, I found Bishop Barron's response very, very um, hope-filled. Now, the question came from a Protestant, and I wanted to bring this up before we get into the video with Bishop Barron. The question came from a Protestant that is very similar to me. They want to see a uniting of the differing branches of Christianity. So let's watch this video. And there is a second part that I want us to be thinking about, and I will mention and comment, and comment on after this video. And the question is this, should Catholics try to convert Protestants? Is that what we should be trying to do? And I will get into a paper that was written in 1994, an ecumenical paper. But first, let's watch what Bishop Barron says because he has timely insights into the unity that we so desperately need in the church today. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Frankie from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hmm. I'm a Protestant, but have always deeply respected and loved the Catholic Church. As a Christian yearning for church unity, our Catholic-Protestant split breaks my heart. My question is whether you see any realistic movement from either side toward reuniting the church, and if not, what in our modern era are the major stumbling blocks? That's a good question today, aren't they? They're, they're all searching. You know, I, let me speak first, as a, just as a, as a person of faith, it believes in the grace of God, believes that Jesus wants us to be united. Based on that, I'm going to say yes. I think there's a reasonable hope that we will be united. Um, we got the 1054 split between East and West, which is also heartbreaking, endures to the present day. We have the 1517 split, which you're quite right, is heartbreaking to any Christian. Gosh, in my lifetime, enormous steps have been taken in regard to both of those. So go back to my, my parents' time. I think people wouldn't have imagined that the Orthodox Roman Catholic split could ever be healed. My, my father and mother, I think, went back in the 19-whatever, 40s, would never have dreamed that the Protestant Catholic split could be healed. But look, in the meantime, we had the Second Vatican Council that put ecumenism right at the heart of the project. And look at Paul VI embracing his counterpart, you know, in, from Constantinople. Um, those are unheard of gestures. Think of in the wake of Vatican II, the um, Catholic Church's statement on justification from 1999, which made extraordinary, I don't want to say concession is not the right word, it, it acknowledged extraordinary points of contact between the Catholic view and the Lutheran view. If, yeah, if, I, um, if, I, if I remember, that wasn't just the Catholic statement, that was a joint right, declaration joint. from Catholics and right. Lutherans together, which was even more Quite significant. Right. Yes, yes. Now, now, is the problem solved? No, <laughs> the problems remain. And I, I've been involved in a lot of Catholic-Protestant arguments and debates over the years, and yeah, a lot of the 16th century things remain. Justification by grace through faith, the authority of the Pope, the nature of the church, nature of the sacraments, I mean, all those. But I would say in the last, what, 50 years, a lot of progress has been made. And just the fact that we're not anathematizing each other, we're not automatically condemning each other to, to perdition, that we are actually in active dialogue with each other, those are really positive uh, signs. So I'm not giving up. Uh, I think serious differences remain. And, uh, you know, I've insisted with my Protestant interlocutors in some cases, of, I, I think there are real differences here that should not be papered over. And we really do take different points of view. But I'm not giving up hope. I think there are signs of, uh, of, of real hope. All right, so once again, Bishop Barron always is just very, very eloquent in his speech. And I don't know how he does it, but he always seems to know the exact right thing to say in every moment. And he does it in an extemporaneous way. He's very spontane uh, spontaneous, which is just mind boggling to me. I'm not like that at all. I just don't know how he does it. And he's just, he's just a great leader for the church. 
Okay, with lots of his comments um, kind of rattling around in my brain, I began to search and seek after, I've been studying Vatican II and I've also been listening to a lot, um, lots of Bishop Barron lately, as y'all know from this channel. And that has kind of led me to stumble across Vatican II, which I didn't really know beforehand, which I, you know, that might sound crazy to you that I don't know anything about Vatican II, but I really didn't know anything about Vatican II. And if you would have asked me uh, to examine Vatican II probably a, you know, year and a half ago, I probably would have told you it was just a liberal paper. Um, so I've come a long way. Um, there's been lots of things that the Lord has been doing in my heart to open up um, just some... I guess, hardness of heart within me that has not seen what God has been trying to do in the world. Even being a missionary, uh, going and living in another country, uh, having a hardness of heart, um, and God really kind of unfleshing that and showing me the great need that we have for an ecumenical movement uh, for the gospel to go forth in the modern world that we find ourselves in. So as I mentioned in the opening, the question that the Protestant asks is really where I'm coming from with my heart at the current moment. Uh, how can we get and unite together? So studying Vatican II, listening to lots of Bishop Barron has led me to, you know, kind of do my own searches. And I stumbled upon a paper that was written in 1994. And it was a group of conservative Catholics and a group of conservative evangelicals coming together and kind of writing a paper. Um, and they had similar conclusions uh, to Bishop Aaron. There's real differences that exist, but because of the grace of God, we need to work together. And the main purpose was a missional emphasis. If we're going to be evangelistic, and I think Vatican II is also in this light, if we're going to be evangelistic, we're going to have to do things. We're going to have to work together to make it happen. And we're going to have to be one um, as Jesus prayed in, in the Gospel of John. So one of the interesting things about this paper that's different from Vatican II, very different from Vatican II, and also different from many of the responses that I hear from Bishop Barron and, and people like Bishop Barron, um, is that this paper says, in effect, this. It says, Protestants should not try to convert Catholics, and Catholics should not try to convert Protestants. Um, they see the differences as irreconcilable. So the unity is not necessarily over a unifying, um, a unity um, theoretically, I, or I, I would say in the idea world, but it's much more in the missional emphasis. We're all Christians. We all believe in the Orthodox creeds. We have different traditions, different, different history, and we have different ways of thinking about the timeless tru truths of the Bible. But we can really work together in different spheres, for example, in society to greatly affect society that we can work together for, let's say, you know, the different cultural, moral issues. I'll just say it that way. Um, we can unify together to kind of have, promote a biblical worldview in various different capacities so that we can reach those who do not have the gospel. But notice it says we are not going to convert one another because if, we're spent, if we spend all of our time, um, and, I'll, and I'll cite the paper at the end of this video, if we spend all of our time trying to convert one another, we're not finding the people that actually need the gospel. Um, so what do y'all think of that? Please chime in in the comments. I want to know what y'all think uh, about that approach. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure on that. That's why I wanted to get a lot of your guys' feedback do you think that Catholics should try to convert Protestants? And, and Protestants, do you think that um, Protestants should try to convert Catholics? I know lots of Protestants. I know lots of Reformational Protestants that I grew up listening to. And I guarantee you they think that we should try to convert Catholics. I'm not so sure on that. Especially since we're both in the Orthodox stream of Christianity. It does seem that we should put less emphasis on... Um, maybe doctrinal differences and we should focus on the missional aspect. Again, I want to know what y'all think. It was interesting and I wanted to provide you guys with some insight. So my, um, I reached out to my pastor, um, who just so happens to be my dad. Um, and he was very, very, very insightful. And he was insightful in this way. So this paper that I'm talking about right now provided, or no, not this paper, but a, a Protestant critique of this paper that was um, um, very, very antagonistic to this ecumenical movement. Um, 
was talking about the differences that are cited within this paper. Now, I don't want to get into what this critical document said, but I, it was insightful to note um, the differences because I didn't go through the entire, you know, 94 paper. That would have taken way too long. Um, but it provides differences that both the conservative Catholics and the conservative evangelicals said, we just cannot agree on these things. These things are going to be differences. So I sent a few of them, five of them to my pastor, and they were either or questions. Um, and that's how they were presented within the paper as well. And so I basically asked him these questions and then I also want to read to you his responses. So the first difference between, irreconcilable difference between these ecumenically minded conservative Catholics and conservative Protestants was, this is a real difference. The difference between the church being an integral part of the gospel or the church as a communal consequence of the gospel. So it's the idea of sacramentalism. Are the sacraments necessary? Are they like a fundamental part of the gospel? Therefore, are they integral to the gospel? Is the church integral to the gospel? Or is the church just kind of a necessary consequence of being regenerated unto, you know, living uh, supernatural life, um, to have faith and to be regenerated? And therefore, it leads you to community. That's kind of the Protestant perspective. The second distinction <coughs> that I'll mention is, is the church a visible communion, which is what the Catholics um, have always taught, or as the Protestants teach, and it's an irreconcilable difference, that the church is an invisible fellowship of true believers. Okay, so is the church visible or invisible? The next one is, is there a sole freedom of the individual Christian, that would be the Protestant position, or is there a teaching magisterium, that's the Catholic position? Again, these are seen as irreconcilable differences. Um, is the Lord's Supper a Eucharistic sacrifice or a memorial meal? And the last one is, is baptism a sacrament of regeneration, meaning baptismal regeneration, you are saved by baptism? Or is it a testimony to regeneration? You might notice here that Protestants are very, very um, philosophical in the sense of they see these things not necessarily as salvific or not necessarily as... Um, the means, but they have effects, right? They necessitate you leading unto those things. So one thing that I would just want to mention passing is that what you see is that these were not that far off here. These are just very, very intricate distinctions that separate us. But anyways, I wanted to get my pastor, who is my dad's views. I wanted to him to basically, I didn't provide him with the paper. I just wanted him to basically explain to me which one he thinks more accurate. So my dad, who is a pastor, does believe, and he's a Protestant, mind you, a Wesleyan Protestant to be very specific, he does believe, like the Catholics, that the church is an integral part of the gospel. My dad has always had a very high view of sacraments, and that's very greatly influenced me throughout my life. And so this idea that the church and its sacraments are integral to the gospel has always been something that my dad has preached and um, I was not shocked for him to say this. But then again, I also pointed out to him, this is not what the Protestants believe, okay? So my dad did believe that the church is not necessarily a visible communion. He did, un he did side with the invisible fellowship of true believers. I think that this is part and parcel to kind of the evangelical Pentecostal stream uh, of the denomination that he is affiliated with. Um, my dad sided not with the sole freedom of the individual Christian, but in a teaching magisterium type office. Now he would differ around which office that is. He would see it as a Protestant office, but he does believe that the pastor or the teacher um, has a, an authority over the, the individual late Christians within a community. My dad didn't like the terminology of Eucharistic sacrifice, but my dad doesn't like the notion of the sacri or the Eucharist only being a memorial meal. He sees the real presence of Christ present within the Eucharist. And my dad um, doesn't believe that we are saved by baptismal regeneration. However, he says that a Christian, if they are a Christian, will get baptized. So you can see kind of the, 
the, the, the, the nuances going here. But what's interesting about this is this is my dad who's a Protestant preacher, and he's actually more Catholic in his understanding of things than he is Protestant. I mean, and this is what I've been noticing a lot lately, is that many people are unaware um, of where Protestantism ultimately leads. They're kind of quasi-Protestants. They're kind of, they're, they're, they would claim to be Protestants, but they're really, really detached um, from what that would ultimately necessitate. Um, many Protestants do not believe there's no creed but the Bible. That's a very, very specific type of Protestant, a Baptist Protestant, um, in the American context even more so. Um, the majority of Christians would hold um, that it's very, very important. Basically, they would hold to the Bible submits to the creeds if, if they're being truly reformational in their understanding of things. And so my entire point with this is that we're a lot closer than I think people realize, and they need to realize how much closer we are in these things um, than is often granted by the media, by social media, um, by maybe even their pastors or their priests, depending on which side you're on. Um, but then again, I want to go back, should Catholics, if that's the case, try to convert Protestants? Should Protestants try to convert Catholics? And I think that the more the church um, is refined, I think that answer is no. I really do. But I'm not 100% sold on that. So I want you guys to let me know what you think. All right, that's all I have for this video. Please be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Peace.